Okay, uh, so it's my turn. Thank you uh, very much. I want to use uh, the opportunity. I have the microphone and before I forget, because I think it's very important, I would like to thank uh, everyone uh, here, uh, the, the teams that contributed to the NPM once again, uh, because uh, I know it's uh, uh, demanding work, a tough work, and uh, we are asking uh, you to uh, do it in a, with tight deadlines on one hand. And I would like to use the opportunity uh, to thank also the NPM team um, that uh, is uh, wonderful, and in, in particular, Marie Palmer, who this year uh, managed the connections uh, with, uh, with the teams, and uh, uh, Maria Zufova, who is not here today. Uh, she's uh, uh, in maternity leave. She is luckily in maternity leave. And uh, um, yes, I, I wanted to, to stress uh, uh, this first. And of course, those who uh, help us every day uh, in the organization of, of our center, including those that help uh, in uh, organizing the, these uh, kind of events. Uh, so uh, that said, um, uh, uh, this year, as uh, was anticipated, we are um, adding uh, to our uh, report, our general report, also a general ranking of uh, uh, the countries. Uh, so the, the first question is, uh, why uh, no ranking so far? So we have done many implementations of the MPM and we never used, uh, we never published, let's say, a, uh, the general ranking based on the average of the, the, um, the scores received uh, uh, by area uh, in each uh, member states, by each member state and uh, uh, the, the, in, in each uh, country that is analyzed by the DMPM. So uh, the uh, reason and uh, the, the logic of uh, not publishing the ranking is uh, in uh, the uh, spirit, in the philosophy of uh, the MPM itself. Um, because uh, the idea of, uh, the original idea of the MPM is uh, first of all to have a risk-based assessment, but a risk-based assessment that is based on a concept of media pluralism that this uh, um, nuance that uh, um, um, encompasses uh, different uh, components of uh, the broader uh, term uh, media pluralism. So uh, considering as you, and you know it very well that we ask a lot of questions. We uh, consider media pluralism as uh, um, composed of various areas of uh, risk. Uh, we do not limit our analysis to media concentration. So given those um, um, considerations, uh, we, uh, are interested in having a, uh, an assessment that is granular, that uh, is a real analysis that takes into account uh, all the nuances of the analysis that uh, we, uh, we carry out. Um, so um, the aim of uh, the MPM from the very beginning, from the first study of uh, uh, Peggy and, and others, uh, Peggy Valk, sorry, and others on uh, the, indi the indicators um, on media pluralism, uh, the aim of the MPM is uh, to uh, be complex somehow. Um, and uh, uh, this allows also to uh, better um, describe the national context and uh, gives also more transparency and granularity and uh, the possibility of spotting where um, a certain policy intervention should be done uh, instead of having a sort of reductio ad unum of uh, the general scores, with the general scores. So, uh, starting from this MPN 2020 implementation, uh, we have decided to introduce the general ranking. Why? Uh, as, first of all, as an additional element of transparency, because uh, we 
regularly know what is the ranking. And um, since it's uh, um, a, an additional information and uh, um, it, it can be um, shared, I think that it's uh, an additional element of transparency, then at least at a certain point will uh, um, let's say shut down all those that say but you are not uh, you never uh, publish the ranking every every time especially journalists ask us uh, uh, for uh, for this data so uh, there is nothing uh, to hide uh, and uh, the uh, within our interpretation of the results i mean our interpretation of the results is that uh, this uh, general ranking uh, can give a reasonable preliminary triage, uh, as we called it, for the risk to media pluralism in a country. Uh, the causes of the illness, but must be explored with the help of the details given in the analysis of the four areas in the country reports. So uh, that's why I use the icon of uh, the electronic um, scanner of the temperature, because it gives an idea of uh, what is, uh, let's say, the general temperature. But in order to understand the causes of the illness, we have to uh, uh, delve into the, uh, the results uh, that were um, explained uh, by uh, our colleagues and that you describe in, in your reports and in your data collection. So uh, this is the, the general ranking for uh, this, this year. I mean, you know that the monitor covers 2021. So uh, the, the general ranking that uh, we um, uh, um, cluster, I mean, the countries are clustered in a different way from uh, the general uh, uh, three uh, band uh, um, distribution of uh, the, uh, let's say, regular results. And uh, because we wanted to give more nuances, I mean, in, in this uh, um, uh, ranking um, that is done uh, calcula calculating the average of the four area scores of the NPM. So as you can see, uh, we have, uh, um, just to, uh, to be clear, we um, divided the groups into uh, five groups from zero to 20%, above 20% to 40, above 40 to 60, to above six, from above 60 to 80, uh, above 80 to 100. And uh, uh, we have uh, then one country that is very uh, low risk that based on the data we collected, uh, with the, the, the MPM uh, um, data collection is uh, Germany. Uh, then we have uh, some countries that uh, score low risk, Sweden, Denmark, the Netherlands, Belgium, France, and Portugal. Uh, and uh, uh, some, let's say, um, the uh, usual <laughs> outlier, let's say, that is Turkey on the other side of, of the ranking, and then uh, decreasing Albania, Poland, Hungary, Bulgaria, Slovenia, Serbia, Greece, Romania, Montenegro, and Malta in the high-risk band. Um, the medium, uh, I mean, the, the, the uh, average of these uh, scores is uh, Italy with uh, um, 51% is 16. So this is uh, the ranking. Uh, uh, we are open to comments, uh, of course, but uh, honestly, I think it's quite reasonable. So uh, before um, uh, going ahead with uh, uh, the, the, the recommendations uh, to the uh, MPM uh, that we, we uh, added to the NPM report, uh, I want to um, uh, stress um, three things that uh, uh, I want to remind everyone that the NPM uh, is uh, uh, a tool that aims at uh, 
um, analyzing the structural conditions uh, uh, that can lead to a deterioration to freedom of expression and media pluralism in a given context. So it takes into account the structural conditions, either legal, economic, or the social political conditions in a country. Uh, so it's just not focusing on the deficiencies of a media system per se. I have to recall that is a risk-based assessment uh, using the philosophy of uh, the, or the working document of the Commission of 2007 that uh, somehow uh, sparked uh, or the, started, the, 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 triggered the discussion on uh, media pluralism in this uh, holistic uh, perspective. Uh, so it's a systematic and analytical process based on predetermined risk criteria, professional judgment and experience to determine the probability that an adverse condition to media pluralism will occur. And uh, mm, another caveat is that uh, the media pluralism monitor is a tool that has been conceived to be implemented in the EU and in candidate countries. So uh, it, it's a tool that uh, takes into account standards that are, let's say, European. Uh, EU standards, Council of Europe standards, uh, common uh, constitutional traditions uh, uh, in EU member states and beyond. So uh, beyond, but uh, I mean, within uh, the uh, regional uh, um, scope of Europe. So, um, uh, I, I'm sure that there, there can be uh, discussion issues, uh, ideas of comparing uh, uh, this uh, ranking with other rankings, uh, but I want to stress that we have to take uh, all above into account when comparing with other rankings. Um, I will then uh, skim through uh, the recommendations uh, in, uh, in the report. As uh, uh, in past years, uh, we are trying to um, uh, elaborate some uh, recommendations, some policy recommendations that can be uh, useful at national, uh, European, uh, level in order to uh, um, develop and, uh, um, I mean, enhance uh, uh, media pluralism in, in Europe based on uh, uh, the, the standards and the definitions and the analysis done by the MPM. So, uh, uh, describing uh, all the uh, recommendations in detail will require another conference probably. And uh, uh, luckily enough, uh, some of my colleagues already uh, mentioned some of these uh, uh, conclusions that are uh, converted uh, somehow into recommendations. So, so uh, when it comes to fundamental protection, uh, um, some of the main issues uh, uh, to be taken into account uh, are those related uh, to access uh, to data when it comes to protection of freedom of expression, for instance, and uh, um, intermediaries are at stake uh, and uh, they are doing, uh, uh, they are operating somehow on the content uh, distributed online. It would be uh, good uh, in terms of uh, um, uh, protecting freedom of expression uh, to have access uh, to the data of the platform in order to analyze ex post uh, what is uh, um, uh, the, the what are the policies how they the policies of uh, the the platforms were implemented and in this regard i also linked with uh, uh, the, the the part on social inclusiveness uh, uh, described by uh, marie before uh, when uh, it comes, for instance, uh, to all the policies that uh, relate to disinformation, for instance, let's think of uh, the um, last uh, um, code of practice on disinformation and how to implement and uh, monitor it. Um, promote the implementation of effective anti-SLAP uh, frameworks, uh, 
um, this is something the Commission is already working on and promoting the decriminalization of defamation at, at national level. Um, I will uh, uh, go quickly through all these uh, proposals. Uh, um, in, when, when it comes to access to information, um, improve transparency, efficiency, and accountability in the context of uh, Freedom of Information Act, uh, ensure the transposition of the implementation of the whistleblower directive, as was, uh, or was already said. Uh, we already talked about the journalistic profession, so uh, the, we elaborate uh, these uh, proposals, uh, I mean, um, in, in a little bit in our report, uh, but just to uh, list them, ensure safety of journalists, promote better working conditions, as we already said, and uh, uh, work on the independence of the media authority too. Uh, when it comes to appointment procedures, independence, uh, appropriate funding and accountability mechanism, because not all the media authorities uh, are working, have the same remit actually uh, across Europe. And it's increasingly important that they uh, somehow work uh, in, in perspective uh, with the same competences in order to um, be able to uh, tackle common problems at European level. So we uh, wish uh, for an enhanced cooperation between authorities, harmonization of the remit, uh, and uh, um, I mean, ensure that uh, all the authorities have uh, um, the means to uh, carry on their work. Um, on market plurality, and this is a part that will be somehow later discussed by also with Sophia because it's part also of the uh, study on uh, media plurality online. Um, uh, harmonization of the data to be disclosed by the media when it comes to transparency, um, transparency vis-a-vis uh, -vis the public and uh, the and a race. So there should be a transparency of media ownership, not only vis-a-vis uh, -vis the, the authorities, but also uh, for the public. Um, uh, media ownership concentration, uh, we um, uh, say that uh, um, what already uh, Roberta um, explained during her presentation, so introducing effective criteria and practices for measuring and assesses, assessing markets uh, and mar audiences concentration, including traditional and online uh, media actors and uh, um, introducing uh, uh, media specific rules at national level, or maybe to some extent also at European level to prohibit uh, positions of uh, dominance in the media sector and uh, introducing the media pluralism test. Um, when it comes to online platforms, concentration and competition enforcement, um, um, something that uh, uh, we advocate, let's say for something that could be introduced in the DMA, uh, specific guidelines and proposals in the media sector to safeguard media pluralism, for instance, uh, uh, for data sharing obligations, um, addressing the risks uh, uh, that are related with position of dominance in the online advertising market, and um, uh, then uh, reporting in a transparent way about uh, the financing to the publisher by the digital platforms in the framework of uh, the EU directive and copyright and relating rights. And also to, to understand whether this implementation works uh, uh, for all the media actors, not only for the big ones. Um, media viability, uh, so there, there was this uh, proposal for a EU fund for pluralism. When it comes to public money um, um, distributed to the 
uh, to the media, there is uh, some resistance, but of course, uh, uh, the, there is a need to strengthen the public support for the media with transparent and accountable criteria for its uh, distribution that, as we, say, uh, we, we saw previously in the um, presentation of uh, Conrad and uh, Roberta, it's, uh, in many countries, it's not the case. Commercial and owner influence over editorial content. Um, uh, for instance, uh, we, we could uh, think of introducing or strengthening public social protection schemes for journalists, including, including freelancers. Um, political independence, uh, um, when it comes of political independence of the media, of course, uh, uh, the idea of rules on uh, conflict of interest uh, can be um, uh, can be suggested. Um, also, um, some kind of uh, rule at European level could be um, thought in this regard. Um, audiovisual media online platform and elections. Uh, um, there are already some uh, standards that are developed by the Council of Europe in this regard. And uh, uh, the European uh, Union is uh, developing a um, regulation on uh, transparency and targeting of political advertising. So the, probably the idea is to follow these standards and see whether they can uh, um, help uh, uh, some, they can give some kind of uh, limited uh, regulation to uh, state, uh, um, sorry, to political advertising online. State regulation of resources, uh, again, transparent rules and allocation of, of state advertising uh, that uh, are uh, one of the main problem in uh, uh, creating a, um, a capture of the uh, the state uh, towards the, the media um, in a, at national level, independence of public service media governance and funding, again, support of uh, public service media. We think that public service media is important uh, even in the digital environment, in the digital age. Uh, should be uh, supported, uh, uh, also uh, considering that uh, it should produce uh, quality uh, journalism, of course. Mm, but, uh, um, of course, uh, um, the support of, to PSM is uh, conditional upon its independence, and uh, um, uh, PSM, in general, should have adequate uh, funding. Uh, last, uh, uh, social inclusiveness, uh, um, somehow the conclusions and the recommendations were already mentioned. Uh, more representation when it comes to access to media for minorities in, uh, at least in PSM, in public service media. Uh, monitoring, as uh, Marie was uh, mentioning, uh, monitoring uh, uh, how minorities are treated, and what is uh, effectively their access uh, to uh, the media system and to uh, the, uh, the, the, the programming of uh, uh, existing media. Access to local regional media and to community media, support to community media, and um, uh, access to media for women, uh, we support the idea of uh, gender equality policy, at least uh, uh, in uh, public service media and self-regulatory mechanisms uh, uh, in, on, on the other media in this regard. Uh, more uh, mandatory training in uh, when it comes to media literacy uh, in school and uh, outside the uh, mandatory um, curricula. Um, education programs, of course, should include disinformation and hate speech, uh, a fight against disinformation and hate speech, uh, ways to recognize better disinformation and uh, avoiding hate speech. Um, 
last uh, but uh, not least, the, the protection against illegal and uh, harm, harmful speech. Um, we um, uh, are for an uh, implementation of the multi-stakeholder regulatory framework, uh, including media authorities, media outlets, and civil society uh, that uh, should be encouraged and privileged over legal frameworks uh, that uh, uh, can be a little bit uh, too rigid somehow in order to fight the cases of disinformation that are often a source of concern for freedom of expression. Uh, so the, we know the, the paths that uh, the European Union is taking. I would add that, uh, um, as I was saying uh, uh, before, um, for instance, uh, an um, important uh, a step is, is to uh, ensure that uh, uh, the implementation of uh, these uh, uh, core regulatory frameworks that the European Union is developing uh, could be um, monitored somehow uh, from by uh, multi-stakeholders uh, bodies or by um, could be in any case analyzed ex post uh, in order to uh, clearly understand wh what is uh, what uh, was the the behavior of the platform if they um, uh, they uh, moderated or uh, curated the content in a way that is uh, in the end compliant, uh, let's say with uh, um, a shared uh, notion of uh, rule of law uh, that includes the protection of freedom of expression. Thank you. So now we open the floor for questions. Uh, maybe Pierluigi wants to intervene uh, just before jumping to the Q&As. Uh, I would like just quickly to remind to the country teams online and in presence that all the questions are for you as well. So feel free to intervene. We are sorry for this disposition uh, of the room. Let's say we would have liked to have a round table uh, where we can all sit and not uh, look at you, but uh, please feel like as if we are in that uh, position. I know I wanted uh, just to, uh, why don't you put back the ranking a second? I want to go back on the ranking because uh, I think that uh, uh, it's good that we underline two things here. Uh, Held has already done it, but I want uh, you to see that we have done two things together. And I want to disentangle them for a second. One thing is, as well explained, we, after a lot of soul searching, we decide to go for a ranking and show it because uh, there were studies that were doing it. So there was no reason not to do in the end, show it in the, uh, in the monitor. Even clear that is not a ranking about uh, the reality of countries is a ranking about risks. So this should be a motivation seen the, an average uh, score for each country to uh, see where they stand, how can they improve, is uh, then clearly how to improve is to go to the single issues, not to the general thing. Uh, so these are the motivation of the ranking, but Elda was clear on this. I wanted to underline the second element of this, the five colors. That is a potential major change in the way in which we do the monitor. Because we are considering, this was simple. That I want to show the trick very clearly. Here is a, a, an arithmetic average of the results of the single areas. The single areas are not based on five colors, are based on three colors, are based to on three variables, three possibilities in the in these choices. But when you do arithmetics, it's easier to divide the way you want, and that's the way we divide it. But somehow, this is telling us that we probably could move on something more sophisticated, because uh, we know that we can have a more granular 
view of the uh, situation of media pluralism. And this could probably help in the future to improve the monitor. Uh, for the quantitative measure, it's relatively easy because numbers can be easily manipulated in even a different scale. For the qualitative discussion, is much more difficult. It will take time, it will take work, but if we are able to do a more granular view of the reality of the risks for pluralism, because we know more, and, and definitely in 2014, we knew much less than we know today, so we know more, and so we can, I think we can, with the help of all of you clearly, slowly improve the monitor and have a sort of step-by-step uh, -step improvement, moving to a more, more granular ability to understand what is going on. And the five colors are a way to go in that direction, in a sense. Uh, and let me be totally honest on this. We want to uh, discourage this idea that uh, everybody can stay in this uh, middle ground, easily in this middle ground of middle risk. This is uh, no good. And this is not what we are trying to do with this instrument. It is trying to show what are the problems and asking countries to improve the situation. So this is a step in that direction. It's not an easy step. A methodological needs a lot of work. This is just a first step that shows that with pure arithmetic, we can do it. Uh, to do it methodologically soundly is much more difficult, but that's the uh, direction we would like to take. Um. Would you excuse me? It's for our friends online. Um, sorry, maybe it is not uh, it is not open the yeah. microphone. Uh, so. Would you be oh, sorry? Would you be so kind to repeat because people are really oh, listening sure. yeah, <laughs> online? I was just going to say that it was more of a comment. I think that the. Um, uh, the center has, with its MPM report, uh, a justified and robust uh, um, move to, to go towards rankings more than anybody else, in, in fact. Even also what Professor Parku said with regard to showing risk rather than anything else. Um, I think that you need to add perhaps the EU member states and the EU candidates as a bar separate from everybody else, because I think it would work as a motivational tricks, trick for the member states that are doing badly vis-a-vis -vis the candidates and, and uh, for the candidates themselves uh, purely as, as a motivation. So uh, it's, it's, it's brave, it's useful, I think it's a positive step and I think it will be newsworthy as well. It will bring more attention to the center, which is quite useful. Sometimes um, that's the way journalists are. Uh, it's very difficult to focus on the substance. You need some sort of uh, tricks to, to make them uh, highlight the ranking. So it's a good move. Thank you. Thank you. 
but and at the same time, I really invite uh, journalists not to oversimplify these uh, these results. I mean, because uh, it's it's a pity to lose all the information that is behind it. So, uh, um, excuse me. Uh, do we decide to take uh, questions from the room first, and then uh, to answer to our online attendees? Yes. So, yeah. So hello everyone, I'm representing the country team of this black line on the right hand side. So uh, Mr. Parko, uh, I think the comment you made is quite uh, important because when it comes to assessing the risks uh, with these existing indicators, uh, it's obvious that we have such a picture. But with the, uh, I mean, since Turkey is in intensive care, and some uh, extraordinary strategies developed by the journalists, the media institutions and by the uh, readers and the uh, audience itself. The new media, and we have been discussing it, uh, and the um, interaction that individual journalists, self-made journalists, and very small newsrooms get are quite five, far higher than the traditional ones. So when we measure the traditional ones, it's not surprising to see such a picture, but the problem is uh, since Turkey is in a kind of extraordinary situation, it's developing its own extraordinary uh, answers to those problems, which may in the future spill to the some uh, Eastern uh, European countries and maybe to the Balkan states. So we might, it might be quite useful to further develop uh, in the future, near future, or in the middle term, the indicators which would uh, embrace the new media platforms for uh, news institutions and journalists. Thank you. Thank you very much. Just a really short comment following actually the, the comments of our colleague. Uh, that's clear that maybe a more clear distinction between uh, EU members and candidates, it give a, uh, a more clear picture of the, the situation. In those and also in the previous slide, of course, it's all in the same basket in some way, but probably in consideration of uh, the institutional background, it's easier to, to see two different pictures, uh, EU and uh, candidates. Thank you. Can you please uh, tell your name before intervening? Because we have also people connected and don't know you. Yes, um, my name is Besar Likmeta. I'm uh, editor for the Balkan Investigative Reporting Network and a member of the Albania country team. I think it's encouraging that uh, the NPM uh, this year is publishing the ranking. So we give um, a snapshot of the place where countries are in terms of comparison to others. It's good for candidate countries, particularly, and for media development professionals to actually communicate it to decision makers. Particularly, we've tried in the past to actually bring forward uh, the results of the NPM to uh, the commission and then to know the it being a tool developed by the, um, for the commission itself to know. And it's, it's been more difficult in terms of if you don't have a ranking of the countries in the region, because it's easier for, uh, let's say, local politicians to relatively say that, oh, but look, one country is worse than the other. And there is always a country, according to their perception, that is worse and merits uh, more attention. In terms of kind of disjointing uh, candidate countries with uh, member state, I don't think that's very productive because media, media, media freedom standards and um, pluralism should be the same across Europe. And there is no reason to have two standards for candidate countries and you know, member states in terms of the work of journalists. The, the way that, I mean, policy is made, then that could be a different point of view. Thank you.
Um, hi, Jan from the German country team. Um, just a quick question. Will you also publish um, sub rankings or rankings for the sub indicators or indicators? But only this one. Thanks. I think um, they couldn't hear the answer from online. Yes, only the general ranking. Um, I, I'm Luisel, I'm from Malta, and I am uh, not surprised, by all, obviously, because I read the report. Um, and not to just keep talking about the general ranking, but I, I really think it's a good idea because journalists have asked me about this before, and I obviously could not give them an answer, but particularly because now we've been part of the monitor for a few years directly, and it's a struggle to... Um, Sort of get politicians to listen the people who change policy and to change the laws to listen to us because they have to read the whole report but like this because <laughs> um you know they can just look at the ranking and um because we have politicians who are obsessed with being the best in europe um this might wake them up you know and make them uh, read the recommendations if nothing else um, so, so I think this is a good idea, and I agree with my colleague here that although it would be, I guess, interesting to see the difference between new countries and not, we are a new country, and yet we're in the red zone, and, you know, the standards should be the same, ideally, everywhere else, because it's, and, and I super agree, and it can't be stressed enough about the medium risk, because medium risk is not a good result, um, so, um, I'm, I'm not trying to make me, myself feel better for being in the red zone, but um, it, you know, it really needs to be stressed because Malta is a very small country. So sometimes we see a concentration of problems that other countries have sort of spread more widely geographically, but we're, we're, we're very overcrowded. We all know each other. We have issues with a lot of political pressure on journalists. So this will hopefully um, see make things start to change so thank you okay great thank you very much um, uh, so we have a couple of questions online uh, i actually would invite uh, the people who wrote them uh, because i see they are from the country team so they can open their mic and video if they want to to uh, pose them to us so we can see their face as well, even if, if they couldn't join physically. So the first question is from Nezana, if she can hear us. Yep. Uh, yeah, uh, thank you very much uh, for all the interesting presentations. I just wanted to, because there are too many aspects of media pluralism, uh, I, I just wanted to use um, uh, some of the main conclusions that uh, that is valid for all the Balkan countries, why the transformation, why the media reforms in, in the entire media sector uh, are very slow, uh, uh, because we are working with the journalist associations in seven ba Balkan countries. And what uh, we have concluded recently that uh, the, one of the biggest issue here in the region is uh, that uh, the journalists, uh, uh, probably somewhere else, somewhere else, but uh, the situation is very difficult here in the region in terms of socio-economic and labor position of the journalists within the newsrooms. So uh, um, uh, we are specifically interested in, uh, in uh, legal mechanism for protection, for, for improving that positions uh, of the journalists, because if they are weak uh, within the environment where they really work, so uh, uh, the level of auto censorship is very, uh, uh, very high, then uh, they, they don't feel safe it, and they don't feel uh, free. So this is, uh, this was my question. Uh, what are the recommendations or the positive, uh, positive practices, experiences of more developed dem democracies in terms of protecting or guaranteeing uh, the labor uh, position and the uh, economic position of journalists uh, uh, with some legal mechanisms. I'm, uh, uh, because uh, we can uh, see that uh, any other measure uh, is not sufficient to, to increase uh, the, this uh, security of the position of journalists within the newsroom. So this was my question.
Okay, thank you, uh, Nezana. And uh, uh, I um, uh, think that on this, uh, we are in some way a holistic tool, and we have uh, so also the solution are uh, solutions are interconnected. And this is not a specific solution for each uh, uh, problem. So it is uh, clear that to address this question, the safety of journalists, the economic safety of journalists, um, the social, con the, the working condition, uh, you need a variety of uh, uh, tools. But uh, um, I think that uh, I strongly invite all of you to step in in this discussion because there are countries with uh, best practices and uh, better laws. Uh, what is uh, clear is that where there is a system in uh, the labor, general labor law and um, general social protection works, this covers in some way also the journalists, but we, in the monitor, we ask for media specific uh, uh, laws and uh, uh, schemes. Um, another um, um, but a common issue is that the, um, uh, the, the this uh, protection is not uh, extended to the self-employed and freelancer journalists. So maybe uh, we are not sure of this. Maybe we will discuss also in the afternoon if there can be the a basis for the. Um, a recommendation or the a principle in the Media Freedom Act to do, uh, to recommend the member states, because it, this is a member state's competence to harmonize this uh, uh, legislation. But uh, of course, also the um, public subsidies can take into consideration the employment, the, the poly, the, what the media industry does uh, in relation to the employment. I mean, subsidizing industry that are five, Firing people is not uh, um, maybe is a um, is a is an issue is a problem. Uh, in uh, general, all the measures that go in to improve media viability uh, strengthen the um, journalistic position. But regarding the editorial autonomy and uh, and giving to give more strength to journalists, even if they are in uh, um, difficult economic condition, setting some also some rules of transparency can be um, can be important because if your uh, um, owner asks you something that you cannot do legally, uh, you, your position is strengthened. And there are and the rules on the, for example, for uh, about the disclosure of the um, content that is sponsored of the sponsored con content are not uh, the, the same all over the countries. Uh, so maybe, uh, I don't know if Daniela wants to say something about safety and also if some of you want to, step in for the specific best practice in your countries. Snezana, uh, thanks for your question. I would, I would like to add that uh, maybe we can have also as best practices um, to hear the opinion and uh, the experience of the four countries that uh, scored uh, as low risk uh, regarding working con conditions of journalists which are Denmark, Germany, Ireland, and Sweden. Then we can do it in the afternoon. And also, um, you talked about the measures that can be taken. We also in the afternoon will have a discussion about the, the media, the proposal for the Media Freedom Act. And one of the proposals is about a fund, maybe an European fund for journalists. Uh, so uh, we can discuss it as a like a, a common measure, not a, like a national uh, measure. And um, yes, just to, to add this, um, I think that uh, from the German team, he's not here uh, at the moment, but uh, if the Denmark, uh, Sweden or Ireland uh, would like, if they are joining online and would like to to have a word on this, uh, it would be, be nice uh, because they they apparently they are low risk, uh, they are low risk countries, so it would be great to hear from them. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm not sure um, someone of them 
is online actually. Um, but uh, we can wait from for for the afternoon, of course, and maybe when Jan is back. Um, yeah, the, so that there is also another issue that uh, is very sensitive across the countries. That is that we need to strengthen the independence, the, the co working condition of independent journalists, and this is something that we um, can find in. Uh, uh, I mean, in often there are journalists that have excellent working conditions that they are not independent in some uh, countries. And I don't know if, um, uh, for example, for Hungary, we spoke about this. I I'm calling you, and uh, because we spoke, Christian, because we spoke about this issue yesterday. And it was very interesting, in my opinion, what you were uh, um, talking that uh, uh, there is a, 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 dif a great difference between uh, journalists and journalists when there is a uh, uh, there are uh, media that are uh, uh, captured by politics. Do you want to to intervene on this or? Is it turning? Should I uh, uh, rephrase what you were saying about what I was talking about yesterday, maybe? So yeah, the 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 issue about journalism in Hungary that. The, the, the non governmental or, or independent side is just very marginal and very not uh, uh, having a big enough voice to reach uh, like a national scale. And it's mostly because of how it's how, how the media landscape is is uh, is owned or 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 dominated by the governmental side. I just wrote down how so if, I, I probably you know. The Central European Press and Media Foundation, who just owns hundreds of, of, of media outlets from, from uh, uh, newspapers to, to audiovisual, radio, and television. And, and so it's a very difficult uh, uh, place to exist. And if you are in the, in, in, the, in the system of this media conglomerate or part of this as a journalist, of course, you are, are rephrasing the political uh, messages as, as it's basically just an outlet for, for political messaging and, and the political propaganda. And so, as you say, there's a difference between journalists and journalists in Hungary, that there are people who are just voices for, for po political messages. And there are people who actually want to tell the truth, but of course they are just very marginal, very little. Also, uh, Jan is back, but first I would like to uh, maybe ask your uh, opinion uh, or your uh, comment to comment on it. Uh, Luiselle from Malta, because uh, talking about in, uh, independent journalism, uh, I remember that from the, the your uh, report that uh, you have this uh, blogger, journalist, Manuel, uh, which is a kind of independent and uh, basically uh, rely on contributions, donations, and also love in Malta, I don't know, but uh, more or less. The commercial. Yes, but uh, please. Uh, there's the shift news, which relies completely. Um, so there's, okay, in Malta there are, there's Manuel Delia, who is an independent blogger, um, he sort of followed in the footsteps of the murdered journalist Daphne Caruana Galizia, who was also an independent blogger. And the problem with that is that you're, a, you're an independent news giving platform, it's just you. And basically, you have no protection. You don't have the protection of an editorial organization, of a newsroom. So that's what happened to Daphne, and she was isolated like that. And an easier target for those people who wanted to silence her. And eventually, they managed. Um, Manuel works in the same way, and he he has no advertising, no direct advertising, just uh, from Google and whatever uh, Hoopla, I think it's cool. Um, and uh, he relies on donations or subscriptions by people who read his blog. And then there's the Shift News as well, who also relies on donations and no direct advertising. But they are a fully fledged newsroom, but it's an independent and new uh, digital native newsroom. So. So, and then there's Loving Malta, which is online, commercial, but it's also commercial. So sometimes you, although they do some very hard hitting stories in terms of politics, uh, and then sometimes you see these light clickbait features, which 
uh, in my opinion, tend to sanitize the reputation of certain politicians who need, you know, some damage control after some scandal or other. Um, so, so in terms of uh, our digital media, you know, it's 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 actually it's it's quite independent when it, when we see these developments. But unfortunately, these happened after the murder of Daphne Caruana Galizia. But just to conclude on Manuel Delia, because he is alone, even he is targeted, as are other activists and journalists, and it becomes a bit too much. Malta is a very small country. He cannot walk in the street without being insulted, without being, you know, verbally abused. And um, so, so in fact, he was given support and taken out of the country for a few months, uh, just to live normally for a few months, you know, because it, it gets a bit intense. Uh, but other journalists suffer this uh, kind of treatment, and it's, it's you know, it, it needs to change, obviously, but until, I mean, Malta is particular as well, because we have political parties who actually own media platforms, media houses, multimedia platforms. It's, it's not illegal for a political party to, you know, operate their station. And then added to that, and I'll stop here, uh, you know, our state, our public service media is also highly influenced by the party and government. Thank you very much. Uh, Jan, uh, you, we were not here, but uh, we had a question from the, the people who are joining online, our country teams from um, North Macedonia. And uh, we'd like to hear from Germany uh, because it's uh, a country with a low risk score for uh, working conditions of journalists. Maybe uh, the labor law, what uh, you have that is different from or uh, social security law that guarantees also uh, a pension scheme for freelancers. I, I don't know, how does it uh, work in, in Germany? So it's specifically about uh, labor law and, and the working conditions. The working conditions and uh, how do you uh, perf perform better than other? Uh... Ah, okay, yeah. Um, Pooh. Um, tough question because uh, that's not my my specialty. But um, as far as I understand, one point, of course, is that um, Germany has quite strong unions, also in the field of journalists, um, and we're working with them together um, quite intense. Um, and uh, we see what they are doing. So they are um, they have broad. Uh, what you say, broad base of, of members, almost all journalists seem to be in some or one of these big unions, uh, and they have specialized um, units for media, and um, they are strong in the public service media, they are strong in the private media field, they are, then there is the, the, the um, uh, press council, which is also quite strong in these things, and um, I guess maybe that's the starting point somehow because then you have close connection to politics and can influence someone. Um, another thing is that maybe the general labor law in Germany is also as far as I know or as far as I can compare it because I, I never compare I just only tip the German things and then the algorithm comes in and makes green or yellow or whatever but um, as far as I understand from from all my friends working in these fields also um, labor law in Germany is quite uh, protective for the labor force. Um, yeah, maybe that's two two highlights or so, but I can go on if you like. <laughs> no, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, the, the, the subject is not uh, so easy to address. Uh, I agree with all uh, things that have been said. And uh, I draw from uh, something that happened in Cyprus uh, during the pandemic, that the support schemes of the government were linked with uh, the condition that no layoffs will take uh, place. So this might be a starting point for uh, um, uh, devising a, a scheme uh, or a framework uh, where support schemes to media by countries could be link, linked also with uh, uh, a principle that moves also this support to journalists and journalistic work, etc., and not uh, be something that is support of the owners. Okay, thank you, Christopher. 
Yes, so uh, um, we have two questions online. Actually, one is an intervention, like some comment uh, on Slovenia from Marco, and then we have a question from Jedidia uh, online as well, uh, who can as well, um, if he wants to switch on his mic and be there. Uh, thank you, and I hope you can hear me. Yes, we hear you very well. Okay, excellent. Um, I'm sorry not to be able to be there in Florence today. Of course, it would be lovely to meet all my colleagues. I just wanted to have a brief sort of response as a, a team member uh, from a country that was one of the probably, and it seems like most problematic in the past year, Slovenia, a country that five years or 10 years ago, if somebody would say that to me, uh, that would seem quite improbable, if not completely um, illusional in a way. And now we are placed somewhere between Serbia and Hungary, which is very appropriate also considering the influence of foreign owners of Slovenian media in the past few years, which are mostly coming from Serbia and from Hungary. I just wanted to uh, sort of continue where my colleague Václav Setka also mentioned the role of politicians. We also have this is specific um, role of politicians as media owners and media co-owners. We also have this situation with political parties. And uh, I'm looking forward to the Czech decision about the prevention of such ownership, also of beneficiary owners in the future, uh, similar to the German decisions about the role of politicians. Uh, we do have a new government for the past month or so. But unfortunately, I must say that I'm not sure if our report for the next year will be let brilliant, because in the past few months, the situation and currently the situation is getting worse and worse at public broadcaster, which still has the management from the previous government. As you all know, the previous government was, let's say, diplomatically quite controversial. And now the new management is actually very active in the field of public broadcaster and we see daily issues from that um, area so i'm sort of announcing that the next year results from slovenia at least and when it comes to the public service broadcaster and its independence and results and so on uh, will most likely not be much better um, simply because the new man, the new management appointed last year by the previous government is very actively trying to ruin editorial integrity, to get rid of all the journalists that are not in line with their ideas. More than 30 journalists have left the public broadcaster over the past few months. Uh, people are living on a daily basis. There have been strikes and so on. And I just wanted to use this opportunity to warn, so to speak, the European public also about the situation in Slovenia, which has sort of improved in general atmosphere when it comes to the media freedom. But unfortunately, about public service broadcasting, we are actually seeing most problematic developments uh, actually in the past few months after the election of new government. So thank you for now. Thank you, Marco. Um, we, I think we can um, ask, ask to Jedidia to jump in. Um, Hi. Yeah. Hello. Um, thanks for, for giving me the floor and thanks uh, to the, the whole CMPF team um, for, for organizing this, uh, this conference, uh, for their whole work during the whole process. Uh, um, I wanted to address the question of market plurality, and it's not always uh, ensured by market-driven solutions uh, if we are to tackle the structural reasons for, well, the reduction of pluralism, for example. Uh, taxes, public funding, calling for more taxes and so forth is good, but the question behind this is where do these funds go and how are they distributed? We had this uh, problem with uh, the negotiations between Google, for instance, in France for the past two years and uh, media outlets, which uh, uh, initially and even very recently, and the thing is not completely, uh, um, there's no definitive solution yet, have led to actually individualized, targeted uh, financing solutions that have left 
a certain number of uh, important segments of the media sector, especially print press uh, on the side. Um, within the solutions and the recommendations you formulate, there's nothing about, for example, proposing something like mutualized infrastructures for smaller print press essentially, but you could also consider it for online press, uh, mutualized infrastructures, um, you know, for distribution, for uh, translating, uh, for printing and so forth, uh, which could be better for media pluralism rather than the atomized uh, funds that are targeted to individual uh, outlets and so forth. So I was wondering, what is the, the what are the sort of premises, the ideological, if I may say, premises of the CMPF? Uh, are they in line with more neoliberal perspectives that come from the uh, European Commission? Or is there space for maybe more, you know, so to speak, mutualized or even socialist uh, perspectives, such as mutual funds, mutualized funds for infrastructures? That's the, the question I had about the, uh, yeah, what is the fundamental perspective on the on uh, this quaint, uh, old-fashioned solution of mutualization of infra infrastructures. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Jadenia. Uh, no, uh, as regards the, um, uh, the your question, the the the, the risks that you. Uh, um, highlight in the French report, and uh, they are hi highlighted in all the countries in which uh, bilateral nego uh, negotiation between platforms and uh, publishers uh, uh, de are de developed. They all highlighted the same risk that is a favor to the incumbent, and also the fact that these negotiations are not transparent. So we we don't know exactly. Um, why and uh, why the amount of the money, the destination, the condition, we don't know. So uh, this is why in the conclusions, we also ask for uh, some uh, uh, way of uh, um, a transparent reporting about this uh, kind of negotiation. Uh, also, uh, maybe in the afternoon, uh, speaking about the digital risks, we will also go um, further uh, analyze this part, but uh, considering that this is, not, this is not the solution, but it is something that is uh, going on. It can be also another risk or not. It, it can be a way to, uh, address the financing uh, uh, problems of the media. It is the only way, one of the, of the way in which uh, they are addressing now, and it raises some risks. So it is exactly because from the countries in which these um, developments are going on uh, that uh, uh, you emphasize these uh, risks that we have a specific question in the questionnaire this year about this. That is not just the implementation of the, uh, the copyright directive because for example, Italy uh, uh, transposed the copyright directive just only in December last year, but uh, the platforms were trying to negotiate to prevent the effects of the directive um, uh, unilaterally. And so this is about the, um, the, the, the thing of the um, one of the possible solution, but there, there are many tools. And of course, the, the forms of uh, mutualized alliances uh, between uh, among uh, uh, media providers, uh, uh, are interesting. This is something that our questionnaire reflects when we ask if there are alternative models that are uh, going on. No, it is not present as a, as a recommendation, but of course it is interesting. Uh, and I think it is not a matter of uh, how we, um, uh, a matter of uh, how can I say, ideological uh, framework of the, um, research because uh, uh, the idea is to find to be, to individ to to find the risks to evaluate the risks and to find solutions. Uh, at some point, we found we can find find that the market 
has uh, blind spots and has failures in uh, in this uh, uh, in the media sector. And there are solutions when there is a market failures, failures, and, uh, and there is there are uh, solutions like a public intervention or other uh, kind of uh, solution. And last thing that I want to say is that uh, among the recommendation in the recommendation there is also this idea uh, to follow con very closely the process of implementation of the digital tax because uh, in the international debate, uh, this is not related to the situation of the media, but uh, we can relate, one of our proposal is that they can be related. Um, this uh, year marking a part of uh, the revenue of the future digital tax uh, to uh, the support uh, to finance the support of the media. And this can be a way in which the redistributing of revenues from platforms to the uh, media uh, content providers is not something that is uh, um, um, uh, related to the market power and market and uh, individual uh, um, negotiation that would exclude the new media, the startups, the, uh, the diverse, the new initiatives. And it, can, it could be uh, in some way uh, organized, taking into consideration also the goal of the media pluralism and not just uh, that we have to save the existing media in some way. So I don't know if I answer to your question, but I think that this is an issue that we have to discuss together with some um, also specific workshop that we can organize on this or something like that. Thank you. Thank you very much, everybody. So we, we have a last question, but uh, uh, Frank Ribiardo posed the question, um, kindly uh, agreed to re uh, bring it in during the round table at three. That is a question um, a little bit more technical on the ranking and, and this idea of the five colors. Uh, so I, I would say we could uh, go for lunch now and have a break. I, I, I wish it was an enjoyable morning for everybody and uh, looking forward for the discussion in the afternoon. Thank you. Uh, okay, yes, uh, so we will start again at half past one with the session on the future of media pluralism um, until uh, 3 p.m. and uh, Vice President uh, Vera Jourova will join us for the last half an hour. So, and there will be a uh, space for questions to her as well. So uh, let's be prepared. Um, and then we will have um, uh, a working meeting. Uh, so we will close um, to the external invites and a working meeting on, on the uh, MPM specifically with the country teams from three to um, 4.15. Thank you.